couple of people have dropped off. Okay. Okay, so we were talking about uh, esteeming others better than ourselves or esteeming the other person uh, per se. And uh, you know, we were calling it the number 10 principle and also the confrontational principle where we care enough to confront the person or we confront the person because we care for them. And both of these enable us as individuals, as leaders to communicate something to the other person that we do care, care for the betterment of the person, right? So, yeah, so if you had a meaningful discussion, so may, maybe if you were able to discuss something in the groups, uh, can one person from each of the groups probably share, you know, what you discussed or what you, um, the things that you were able to discuss? Um, I think there were about seven groups. So if you could just uh, maybe take a minute, that would be great. Anyone? Maybe I'll start. Okay, Kennedy, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, thank you. Maybe I think time was short. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, you have uh, that. Time was short. Mm. But uh, one meaningful thing that I learned is from my brother, Rabaka K. We had two of them. He had two of them. He, like, these challenges that is, the challenges that he had, his place of work, where people are using foul language, of which it was not very encouraging and he was not comfortable with it, and uh, how God taught guided him to overcome that. And uh, it's like it's changed some of the colleagues. Now, the way they are approaching it, it's totally different. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kenny. So, um, um, so who was this person? Prabhaka? It was Prabhaka K. Prabhaka, okay. okay. So, Prabhaka, can you just share with us, um, like, what was the practical steps you took in order to overcome this? You know? Yes, Pastor. Yeah. Uh, so, initially, I tried to uh, confront, to say to him, uh, a friend, that I, 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 would, I would encourage if you don't talk to me, like, before he could approach, I, I went and spoke. I don't want him to speak to me in that way, in a foul language, because he was using... But that didn't work. Like he, he said, oh, he's uh, the regular thing. Uh, as if he's so holy and all that. Uh, then I went to the Lord and prayed, uh, how do I overcome this? Then a uh, few principles I learned, like when somebody speaks, like um, don't focus on that. Uh, don't encourage, don't react to it uh, uh, when they speak don't focus don't like suppose they say something that is irrelevant don't pay attention and respond uh, only things that that is right so i did that i when they try to speak in a language that is not pleasant i didn't focus on them uh, so slowly he got to know okay he doesn't like this way and at the same time i was not very hard on him i i, I was responding to other things if he uh, speaking a language that I, I i like i would respond to him so in that way uh, uh, he stopped speaking when he approaches me he doesn't speak in that way okay okay thank you thank you Prabhaka. um okay anyone else from any of the other groups? Uh, Pastor, we had Louis and uh, Simran uh, in our group. I okay. was, yeah. I, uh, so Lu uh, Louis was sharing that um, as a uh, as a child, how his teacher encouraged him, uh, how the teacher applied the number 10 principle on him that worked uh, really well in his life, uh, although he was, uh, 
kind of below average and he really moved on to uh, top the class and he, he still holds on to it in the way that uh, the teacher has encouraged him okay okay <clears throat> anything uh, anything more that you could discuss um so we i was just uh, thinking how appropriately to apply the number 10 principle like would it uh would it cause like if you as- associate some like a, a, a kind of an appreciation to a person and would it kind of cause them to have some kind of a pride and lose out on it or do you apply it to specific actions so that they take the right path and go through that action or would it be to a uh, to the person uh, and mm-hmm. like um Jesus was specific about uh, what they would do, uh, uh, not associating to a person that you are like this, and not let uh, kind of a pride set in that stops them from doing things. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I think we can all. Um... you know we can all definitely uh, appreciate the effort of the person you know um uh, sometimes you know the i i I, mean, uh, i just you know as you were sharing this i just had this thought that uh, i remember having a conversation with another person and uh, you know so uh, this was uh, this was about actually a little child who uh, who you know drew something painted something and uh, and we were like oh that was very good I said that is very good so then uh, so he had the question you know you know you know that it's a child at the same time you know maybe that uh, you know whatever the child put together is not great okay so would it be you know all these compliments you know would it be sincere and would it really help the child you know so that's when uh, then i realized you know you can always uh, appreciate the effort the hard work went in Uh, that the you know the child has put in the person has put in um and of course we will have to recognize you know in a professional setting we would have to recognize the outcome you know that's that matters but we can always appreciate the uh, the efforts put in and that way you know we will be in a way uh, showing the uh, or communicating the number 10 principle or putting into practice you know esteeming that person you know to um, do that um um you know one of the practical things that i uh, uh, you know also uh, experience and also what pastor has been you know teaching us um uh, is that um well a person might be skilled or talent or gifted um and so while we we as uh, leaders maybe we are mentoring discipling you know whatever we are doing that um to not really you know focus too much on the on the gifts and the skills and the abilities you know the person could be hiding behind that it's not that we don't compliment we don't uh, you know appreciate but not to really focus fully or wholly on that uh, but also on the other areas of development and to appreciate uh, the efforts put into other areas of you know development um, uh, yeah i just thought i'd share that uh, okay uh, yeah just being genuine is so important <laughs> right yeah yeah. yeah 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 that is true because over a period of time you just um, if um, you know someone doesn't uh, i mean initially it makes a lot of impact you know if a person is just gushing or <laughs> overflowing with compliments and gushing and all that but then over a period of time you know if it's not sincere uh if this person is going to be very superlative about everything um then you know oh wow what a great cup of hot water <laughs> you know what i mean then it's going to be a little you know insincere and uh, and it's it's it it will work the other way around right rather than help the person it works the other way around uh, so that is that is true yeah okay anyone else um others were part, part of the uh, other groups um yeah chris yes. so in in my group uh, there was uh, 
Sister Avni and uh, Abhishek. And uh, we were uh, going through the uh, number 10 principle. So I just shared one of my experiences in, in, the, in, the, in the corporate uh, environment where um, I was um, uh, after a group that was, that was uh, working closely with two other, uh, two other lines of business. And um, the people who were in charge of those two lines of business, uh, one person I had, uh, I had a, I had a personal bias, and um, uh, I realized in the long run that it actually did not did not work well. So this was actually a lesson learned, where uh, this person whom I had a personal bias with was someone who, you know, always recognized our people who, you know. Work closely and worked effectively with uh, with people, and because of the personal bias, I did not, you know, I didn't really, uh, you know, spend uh, work as closely, uh, you know, with that person versus you know the other person. So uh, in the long run, it, it did not work well for me. So it's basically a lesson learned for myself. Right. And um, for uh, Sister Avni, I think maybe uh, Sister Avni, you can you can share your. Um, she had a story uh, that uh, she also shared with us. Oh yeah. Please, uh, Ani, you can go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you, Christopher, brother, and uh, yes, Pastor. So this is about my when I was new, newly born again, and I started going to this fellowship where we were five ladies worshiping. So one of these persons would come there, and uh, she, uh, you know, I I did not get along with her well. You know, I always wanted to avoid talking to her, and you know, listening to her, and. So I was uh, uh, not able to understand her at all. So we, we, but we fellowship day after day and for years we fellowship. Then I moved from Delhi to Bangalore and out of those five, uh, I reconnected with that person again. And today, uh, you know, I overcame, I overcame those bias I had about her because I came to know about her story. She's been through a very, very tough time in life and um, because of too much of complaining and all, I used to resent her. But then I was able to help her deal with those things. And we we, we would simply pray together. And today, on a daily basis, we pray together. And she's able to, you know, come out of her, a lot of her past hurts and being able to, you know, overcome those areas where she needed help. So Lord has dealt uh, with us so mercifully and generously that today she's become my best friend uh, and we are, uh, you know, able to help each other, encourage each other, pray for each other. And she's being truly helped in that area. She's still alone, but she's fighting the battles in, in, in the hope and more with more strength because of the praying together and uh, right. a lot together. So that's how I could overcome. And Lord has been graceful to help us. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, wonderful to hear that. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, Anyone else? Uh, what about your group's uh, your group, Rose? Uh, Rose, I, I know you you mentioned that there was not enough time. But um, anybody from your group? Um, I uh, yes, Pastor. Thank you. Um, uh, it was me, Sister Rupa, and Sister Bracy, and I was sharing about my personal experience with the Number Ten Principle because where I am working currently is I have to face people in different walks of life. So I was sharing that I truly believe in treating everyone the same and even seeing them as that number 10, despite that what I see obviously in front of me. And this has created an environment for them to open up and put down their defenses. So just being non-judgmental and unbiased and I have learned that everyone is just the same, essentially, and deep down, people instinctively react to what is being thrown to them. And just as Jesus approached to the strangers, even though he probably knew what was truly going on inside the person, he treated them as, you know, what they are potentially, uh, what they can be. Yeah. Right. Right. So I was just reminded of, um, I just met a person quite recently, um, just a few, uh, this is the beginning of this week, actually. Um, I mean, uh, he has been through a lot. He's a young chap, 
uh, he's been through a lot right from his teenage years you know very very difficult um, childhood um, you know parents uh, I mean mother incarcerated and imprisoned and so on so I mean very very tough childhood uh, but just to see him come out of it and and, uh, and of course picked up you know a lot of other things which were weighing him down like addictions and so on but but just because somebody believed in him and um, and and really uh, you know pulled out that gold uh, in him and um, and and more importantly you know not just uh, you know the fact that uh, he had the potential but the fact that, that the lord uh, had plans for him you know, the lord has had purposes for him and uh, so when i met him he was this confident and he is, is overcome quite a bit and uh, you know willing to change willing to put in so much of uh, you know effort and being disciplined and so on and and just thriving you know um, in and i was just praising god you know for for this person who really took care you know this person knew the mother and uh, so was able to I'm, I'm sure i'm not able to share more details with us i i can't really it's confidential so but the fact is that uh, you know this person really really believed in him and uh, and and caused him to look inward and you know more importantly at at the lord so he becoming a believer and it was so beautiful to see that so um really it's um, an outworking or you know the tangible um, display of uh, of this you know of this principle of, of course a lot of other factors involved but the but the key thing was this that the person believed in him and uh, and pointed to god who believed in him you know who who believed that he could change because of his power working in him so Wow, it is absolutely amazing to see that. I just went away, you know, from that meeting thinking, I wish we had more people like this, people who would reach out to the depths of, you know, totally hopeless situations, you know, where society does not want them, where uh, they're out of prison, society does not want them, family does not want them because of the stigma involved, doesn't know how to relate to them. And this person is just picking up such people and investing, you know, pointing them to the truth. And it's a slow, you know, slow process, but it's amazing to see the fruit of that. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Anyone else um, before we move on? Anyone else? Um... Sir, a small. Yeah. Yeah, please uh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. In our fellowship, uh, we have uh, some of HIV patients, uh, but we don't disclose that to everyone. But uh, some of them they know, but they, they feel at home, uh, no inhibition, and they're uh, by God's grace. In the beginning, they, uh, they came from Hindu backgrounds and fully dejected and depressed and uh, society has really in some villages it's very difficult but uh, through this fellowship we could uh, support them and now they are really growing in the lord enjoying the goodness of the lord rejoicing in him and reaching out to others with the gospel so i, I think any person when we apply this 10 principle they can come out of whatever situation they are in they have seen so many cases not only hiv aids patients but different from different backgrounds and if, uh, people who have not studied and we have a mixture of people because we have doctors and we have also people who, who are not educated but still in this fellowship they they feel at home and they can move together uh, without any inhibition or hindrance because of the work of the spirit in us mm. just wanted to share it thank you wow. yeah thank you Rupa. so wonderful to hear that yeah and what i also realize is that um, you know like for some uh, who are uh, you know totally in a very bad place uh, maybe because of addictions you know i just thought i'll just mention that um they also need the firmness they also need the you know somebody to make the decisions with regarding 
regarding their schedule, discipline, you know, uh, they, they need that firmness as well. Um, uh, and uh, so that is also, you know, uh, required to go with it. Um, not only do we, do I believe in you, but, uh, you know, but here are some things that, you know, since you, so you want to change, here are some things that, uh, that you need to hold on to. I'm going to hold you accountable to this, right? Uh, that firmness and the discipline. Um, so I, I, you know, that needs to go hand in hand as well. Right. Wonderful. Okay, so let's. Um, uh, anybody f about the confrontation principle? Anything that uh, you could share? Um, so so far, we've been hearing about the number ten. So probably you didn't move beyond the number ten principle. Yeah, is that the reason? Um, something about confrontation. Um, okay, so um, yeah, I guess not. No problem. So we'll, let's let's move on to the 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 next one, which is uh, building trust. Uh, building trust mutually. You know, uh, it takes two people um, to trust one another, and uh, both need to have mutual trust to to have uh, a win-win situation, right? So so when we um, when we need to uh, when, uh, what would really help us in focusing on, on others is to to build that trust. Okay, so um, so we're going to look at that. I, I just want us to watch the video, uh, and uh, and then we will uh, have a discussion on that. Right? Um, um, yeah. So let me share the video with you. Go to the third level of relationships, which is the trust level. Can we build mutual trust? At this level, there are five people principles. Number 12, the bedrock principle. The bedrock principle basically says trust is the foundation of any relationship. George MacDonald said it right when he said, it is a greater compliment to be trusted than to be loved. And the question is, that I must ask myself, am I a trustworthy person? Warren Bennis says, integrity is the basis of trust, which is not so much an ingredient of leadership as it is a product. It is the one quality that cannot be acquired, but must be earned. It is given by coworkers and followers, and without it, the leader cannot function. So three truths about trust. Number one, trust begins with yourself. That's why Shakespeare wrote, this above all to thine own self be true, and it must follow as the night the day, thou canst not then be false to any man. If you're not honest with yourself, you will not be capable of honesty with others. Self-deception is the enemy of relationships. It also undermines personal growth. If a person does not admit his shortcomings, he cannot improve them. It goes back to a principle we've already learned, the mirror principle. The first person we must examine is ourselves. Trust begins with yourself. Number two, trust cannot be compartmentalized. Cheryl Beal, the wife and friend of a friend and author Bob Beal, says, one of the realities of life is that if you can't trust a person at all points, you can't trust him or her at any point. Goes back to a book I wrote, There's No Such Thing as Business Ethics. Why? <laughs> because there's no such thing as business ethics. There's just ethics. You can't compartmentalize ethics. You can't compartmentalize trust. You can't, you can't look at your people and, that work with you and say, you can trust me, and go home to your family and say, you can't trust me. You, 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 it's got to be... Trust in all areas. Thirdly, trust works like a bank account. Like Abershoff, author of It's Your Ship, states, trust is like a bank account. You have got to keep making deposits if you want it to grow. On occasions, things will go, things will go wrong and you have to make a withdrawal. 
Meanwhile, it is sitting in the bank earning interest. It's a great comparison. You've got trust is like a bank account. You've got to be putting something in. And if you and I are, I use the phrase, it's like coins in my pocket. It's like change in my pocket. And, and, and I'm, either, I'm either gathering change and having more or else I, I'm losing change. And, and here's what I want you to understand in this area of trust. When you and I fail, if we have, if we have been trustworthy and we have made a lot of deposits, we have something we can lean on that will get us through it. But, but if, if we're low on our trust change and we do something wrong, we're bankrupt. So questions to ask yourself. Questions such as, am I making deposits? Think about your most important relationships. Are you exhibiting trustworthy behavior that's putting relational money in the bank? Am I making withdrawals? Have you undermined trust in any of these important relationships? If so, you need to try to make things right. Don't wait another minute to take the appropriate action by doing the following. In other words, if you are withdrawing and you're, you're, you're losing trust, number one, apologize. Number two, ask yourself why you broke trust. Spend some time with yourself. And I would also say, if you can't figure that out, Go to someone who cares much for you and ask them, why have I broken this trust? Number three, correct the trust issue in your life. Once you have discovered why you have broken a trust, now let's make some real effort to correct this issue in your life. Number four, boy, this one is so true. Recognize that it takes longer to restore trust than to lose it. You lose trust, I lose trust quickly. And when I do lose trust, it takes a long time to restore it. Again, in my counseling with people in the area of relationships, that's one of the reasons I've always said, have relationships that are always trustworthy because if you break that trust in a relationship, you can break that trust very quickly, but it takes a long time to rebuild it. Number five, remember trust is restored by deeds, not just words. In other words, doing these things won't earn you new change, but it may stop you from losing more, and you just might save a relationship. A great question to ask is this one. Am I compounding my trust? Mike Krzyzewski, the head coach in basketball at Duke University, offers this advice. If you set up an atmosphere of communication and trust, it becomes a tradition. Older team members will establish your credibility with newer ones. And even if you don't like everything about, they don't like everything about you, they still say he's trustworthy, he's committed to us in a team. Back in 1978, I had a, a friend that has been one of my mentors throughout life. His name is Tom Philippi. And I was very, very young and um, starting to get a little bit of success. And Tom sat down with me one day, I'll never forget, over dinner, and he said, John, he says, you're doing good. And he said, you're going to do very well. And he said, one of the issues that you're going to have that will be the most difficult as you get successful is you're going to always be asking yourself, who can I trust? Why are they around me? What do they want? What's in it for them? And I'll never forget, he looked at me and, and he said, I just want you to know that as you journey in your life, I will always be a trustworthy person for you. You will always be able to trust me. Now that was said to me, oh my goodness, that was said to me in the 70s. That was said to me 30 years ago. And I have found that Tom to be exactly that kind of a friend. He, he, it's been tested. His trust has been tested dozens of times. And he's never violated it. And it's been a great encouragement to me to be also that kind of a trustworthy friend to someone else, somebody that they can just trust. In closing on this people principle, writer and chaplain to Queen Victoria Charles Kingsley said, 
A blessed thing it is for any man or woman to have a friend, one human soul, whom we can trust utterly. I love this phrase right here. Who knows the best and the worst of us and who loves us in spite of all of our faults. Whew. That's a major statement. People principle number 13. The situation principle. Never let the situation mean more than the relationship. The question I must ask myself is, do I sometimes put the situation ahead of my relationship? I one time had a friend of mine tell me, it's more rewarding to resolve a situation than it is to dissolve a relationship, and that is so very, very true. You know, when you and I take our um, marriage vows and we, we, we get married, of course, again, you can talk no sense into them. So they're just holding hands and thinking about the wedding cake, and it just, it's, you know, hello. But there's a reason in those vows that we talk about for better or worse, for richer, for poor. Now, now you'll see, again, I don't think they do any good because we're all thinking for better, for richer. I mean, it's just kind of worthless. But you're trying to help them understand there is a downside in making commitment. Now, the good news is, although you can't do much about it that day, they will very quickly find the other side. They'll very quickly realize that there's as much worse sometimes as there is better and that life is di difficult. Now, here's what I want you to understand. Situations that occur, it's those situations and how we handle those situations that will either draw us closer in our relationship or it will begin to separate us in that relationship. So in your notes, take a moment to think about your relationships and now look at the following list and determine which words best describe them. And you can see the bad ones are on the left and the good ones are on the right. Volatile or steady, deceitful or open. Selfish or mature, draining or refreshing, insecure or secure, manipulating or accepting, conditional or unconditional, breaking or bonding. The column on the left describes interaction where the relationship fluctuates with the situation. Boy, that's so true. The column on the right describes interaction where the relationship is rock solid regardless of the situation. In my book, Today Matters, I write, successful people make right decisions early, and then they manage those decisions daily. And to keep your perspective and prevent you from allowing the situation to become more important than the relationship, you can ask yourself several questions. I suggest you start with these four. Do I see the big picture or just the bad picture? And number two, do I communicate the big picture along with the bad one? I'll stop here just for a moment to say, I, I grew up in a wonderful home. I had tremendous parents. In fact, they're still alive. And I was an ordinary kid. You find that would be very difficult for you to imagine that, but I was an ordinary kid. I just, not like a bad kid. I just, if you're high energy and you're creative, you just get in trouble. And I did. And my parents, before they would discipline me, I can still remember it so well, they, you know, because I'm going, here it comes, I'm going to get disciplined again. In fact, there are many times when I would be doing something saying, this will cost me. <laughs> this will cost me. But it is so much fun, <sighs> I'll pay the price. And before disciplining me, never, ever was I disciplined without them first talking about how unconditionally they loved me. Now, as a kid, I, I, my thing back to them was, if you love me, you won't discipline me. You know, I, and I'm, I think maybe there's a softness or an opening for debate here or negotiation, and I never won that one. 
30 minutes after the discipline, without fail. Hundreds of times this has happened. Mom or dad would come around, hold me, love on me, and tell me how valuable I was and how important I was and how unconditionally they loved me. They sandwiched it. And I'm going to tell you something. My self-image and who I am and what I think about myself is wrapped up in that ability to, to see the big picture, to have a total perspective, to, to never allow the situation to become more important than the relationship. Question number three, do I make, oh my, I see this happen so much. Do I make too many situations a life or death issue? Some families, some people at the workplace, just everything is life or death. And Dean Smith was so right, used to be the coach at North Carolina, basketball coach. He said, if you make every game a life and death proposition, you'll be dead a lot. <laughs> In other words, we need to pick our battle. I just see some people, they just get upset over the smallest of things. And what I've discovered about them is that almost always when people get upset over all the little things and make big things out of the little things, it's not the little things that's the problem. It's issues in their own heart that they've never resolved. Number four, is this a one-time situation or an oft-repeated one? There's a big difference between a situation that occurs once and one that occurs again and again. Both affect the relationship and both require commitment. However, a recurring issue will need the commitment from all parties involved to sustain the relationship and ultimately change the situation. But if it's a one-time deal, be careful. Don't, again, let the situation mean more than the relationship. People principle number 14, the Bob principle. When Bob has a problem with everyone, Bob is usually the problem. Boy, that's the truth. Alexander Pope says, all seems infected that the infected spy as all looks yellow to the jaundiced eye. And the question I must ask myself, am I Bob? Because it's so true. If Bob has a problem with everyone, usually Bob's the problem. And all of us, as we're taking these notes and listening to this relationship teaching, every one of us know Bob, don't we, huh? I mean, just, you know, no matter where he is, there are problems. Or not always Bob. It can be Bobetta. <laughs> so how do you know Bob when you see him? Number one, Bob is a problem carrier. He just is. He carries problems with him. You have mail carriers. You understand? And every day they go and deliver the mail. We've got problem carriers. Every day they walk around delivering problems to people. As a young leader, again, having a board meetings in the congregation that I was leading, it, it, it was just amazing. Every board meeting, there would be three or four of the board members that would say, well, we're having a problem here. We're having a problem there. And, and it's, I'll never forget, after doing this for about five or six months, I said, you know what, let's do. I, I, let's, if we're, going to, if we're going to represent somebody that says there's a problem, I said, we have, to, we have to say who it was. We just have to put a name with that problem. I'll never forget the next meeting when somebody said, well, there's a problem here. I, I'd say, who told you that? And they gave me a name. And I'll never forget, on the other side, the guy said, well, they told me that too. We discovered in a congregation of about 800, there were 11 people that were problem carriers. Every day they got up and delivered problems to certain people. And once we identified them and realized we were all carrying the problem mail, 
for the problem carriers. We decided we weren't going to put it in our sack anymore. You understand? See, some people, some people can find, some people can find a solution in every problem, and there are a lot of people who can find a problem in every solution. They're problem carriers. Then the, Bob, Bob's not only a problem carrier, he's a problem finder. Oh, yes. Bob also likes to find problems and expose them to others. He subscribes to Chisholm's second law, which says, anytime things appear to be going better, you have overlooked something. <laughs> Thirdly, Bob is a problem creator. Yes, he is. In fact, I've often said that, that people basically carry two buckets around with them, and when a problem breaks out, they either have a bucket of water or a bucket of gasoline. And when that little fire, you know, starts to spark a little bit, they either take that bucket of, of water and smother it out, and it's just been nothing but a whiff of smoke, or else they take that bucket of gasoline, and when they get done with the little deal, it's a big deal. I mean, there are just some people, no matter how little the problem is, when they're done with it, you've got a disaster. It's their gift. <laughs> And then Bob is a problem receiver. He's not only a carrier, finder, and a creator. He, he receives problems. He's like, the, he's like the lady. True story. Great story. When I went to, in San Diego, when I went to a congregation there, I, I, there were just some problems that just, there were just several groups of ladies who seemed to have problems. And I'd bring them in and I'd talk to them. And after doing about, doing, talking about 12 different groups, all of a sudden it hit me one day that there was one lady. Every time I brought a group in, there she was. And all of a sudden it hit me. So I called her in, and I'll call her Bobby. <laughs> and I said, Bobby, I said, I, I just noticed that every time there's a problem, you are in the midst thereof. And I said, I've come to the conclusion, Bobby, that I want to help you with your issue. I've come to the conclusion that you are a, a problem carrier, finder, creator, and receiver. In fact, I said, Bobby, let me use an analogy we can get our hands around here. You're like a garbage dump. I said, when the garbage truck comes down the street, you know what they do? They pick up garbage. I put my garbage out there, you know what I mean? And they come and they, they, they pick it up they, and they take it away. And all day long, they collect garbage and fill their truck up. And at the end of the day, they drive their truck to a certain place. And there's one place in town that loves garbage. It's called the garbage dump. I said, they never take their truck and back up to my front yard start to dump it. I mean, I'd be out there so quick. I mean, hello, they know better than that. They're not going to dump it in your yard because they know we don't want it. But there's one place that wants garbage. All the garbage of the city every day seeks it out, backs up, dumps it. Bobby, you're the dump. People seek you out. They have garbage, and they say, oh, I know who wants this. They don't dump it at my house. They take it to your place. So what do you do about Bob? What do you do about Bobby? Number one, respond with a positive comment when they start dumping stuff on you. Number two, encourage steps towards resolution. Any time someone brings you a problem that he has with another person and hasn't personally addressed the problem with that other person, he's really engaging in gossip. You are too if you listen to it. Years ago, I came across again Dear Abby, who illustrates the destructive power of gossip. My name is Gossip. I have no respect for justice. I maim without killing. I break hearts and ruin lives. I'm cunning and malicious and gather strength with age. The more I'm quoted, the more I'm believed. My victims are helpless. They cannot protect themselves against me because I have no name and I have no face. To track me down is impossible. The harder you try, the more elusive I become. I am nobody's friends, and once I tarnish a reputation, it is never the same. I topple governments and wreck marriages. I ruin careers and cause sleepless nights, heartaches, and indigestion. I make innocent people cry in their pillows 
Even my name hisses. I'm called gossip. Number three, ask Bob to think before speaking. The letter T, is it true? The letter H, is it helpful? The letter I, is it inspiring? The letter N, is it necessary? And the letter K, is it kind? And one more thing. Number four, keep Bob away from others. <laughs> As much as possible, isolate Bob. If necessary. I think we'll stop there. <clears throat> we looked at some, you know, some hard hitting facts there. Um, three things, right? One is about trust. The other one about uh, how we place relationships with regard to the situation. And the third thing about uh, problems and certain kinds of people, you know, it could be us who, who are, I mean, it, it, who are drawn to problems, not just to, uh, not to solve them, but really to talk about it, to, you know, to discuss it, maybe even to create it, make it worse. Um, so, and, and especially, you know, if uh, I'm just reminded of that uh, example of this um, person going to see a doctor, <clears throat> and the person says, you know, doctor, you know, I'm just hurting. Uh, there's something wrong with me. I'm hurting all over, right? So the person goes and, uh, and, and so the doctor asks, where? Where are you hurting? This, 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 you know, I'm hurting here. You know, I'm hurting here. I'm hurting here. I'm hurting here. I'm hurting here. And the doctor ex examines, and there's nothing wrong. But the problem is that you know, there's nothing wrong with the head, nothing wrong with the face, nothing wrong with the shoulder, nothing wrong with the chest, and wherever this person was pointing. But there was something wrong with the finger, with which the person, the finger was broken. So wherever the finger was placed. It was obviously, you know, hurting, right? Uh, sometimes it's like that, right? Um, so when, you know, we have a, a problem with ourselves, uh, then, you know, everything we see uh, is a problem. Every person we meet is a problem. And we've not really, you know, solved, resolved the problem with ourselves, right? Okay, so um, I think the, the one about trust was very, very, um, uh, I mean, very uh, important. You know, can we trust ourselves or am I a trustworthy person? I think that's something that we can work on, you know, uh, as much as we expect trust from our team leaders, we expect trust from our, uh, from our you know, from our peers, uh, we expect trust in, you know, all relationships, you know, that's it's a natural expectation but can can we say that we are trustworthy you know that's uh, that's a very important question have we uh, in the recent past or in the you know uh, uh, in in the past you know, are we consistent in our speech in our action in our um, commitment um, is our yes a yes or is our no a no or do we say yes and and not really, you know, explain if it's you know if it becomes a no, right? Not really explain or give valid reasons, or are, or are they just excuses, or is it just silence sometimes, right? So um, it's really important for us to ask that question and address that issue um, with ourselves. So as much as we want to build trust. Uh, we see that it starts with us, right? and also the second thing about uh, about relationships: are we, um, you know, it, it's it's again, it's a it's a very fine line, right? Um, where um, you know, when it comes to family, maybe we value the relationship. When it comes to maybe certain <clears throat> you know ministry associations, we value the uh, maybe not every 
environment or every situation you know we value the relationships where we you know sometimes value the situation more you know? um and i've you know we've, i've seen it happen at, in a, in the workplace maybe a you know in a like a salesperson customer kind of a you know relationship where you want the situation you know you want to benefit out of the situation and you don't really care for the you know for the end user and for that moment we actually win it is a win you know targets are achieved you know we've said something we've committed something and we which we have absolutely <clears throat> have no intention of keeping right and that day is one that month is one you've kept your job you've achieved your targets you've got your incentives but we know that we've lost the person you know there is uh, a time when the person realizes that this is uh, you know this is a person not to be trusted they have not kept the commitments and so it does more damage right first of all you've lost your trust uh, second of all there's no lasting you know business coming from that person so you don't really grow the customer uh, you know they, it's it's very short lived and uh, there's no repeat business coming from that customer you know i'm just using this example sure yeah there's there are, you know other places where you can apply this as well so um so when we give importance priority to the situation without valuing the relationship right in the long run it it is always we always lose right okay so we'll stop here and uh, we'll proceed in the next class so you all have a good weekend god bless um we'll see you next week bye bye thank you pastor thank you pastor right thank bye you pastor. god bless thank you pastor thank you bye bye